Welcome back to the podcast history of our world. Chapter 42, The Age of Pericles. In spite of the conspiracy to stop it and the bloodshed to prevent it, Athens finally had a democracy. Not a sunshine and lollipops version of it, mind you, but a system that gave far more power to the average citizen than any government had before. And even though the chief architect had been silenced by an assassin's blade, nothing would stop its ascendancy. For the reins had been passed over to a new leader, eminently capable of controlling this wild new ride, Pericles, the Olympian. The son of powerful and wealthy parents, and already a political beast, he was called the Olympian due to his strong, forceful presence. Nothing could sway the mighty Pericles from his path. Why, in 463, when he was lead prosecutor against Chemon for bribery charges, El Panike, that socialite sister from episode 35, begged for his mercy, pleading with him to abandon the case, and he could have anything he wanted from her in exchange. He coldly replied, too old, Elpenike, too old to meddle with such business. Look out, Athens, he's a man with a silver tongue. Why, he could convince anybody of anything. And as one famous wrestler of the day put it, If I wrestled him to the ground, he would deny this, and deny it so vigorously that he would convince even those who witnessed the fight. Ah, such was the power of the Olympian, a mighty nickname for a mighty man, and totally not because of a deformity at birth which left his head pointed like a mountaintop. No, for that he was called Squillhead, after a type of tall grass. True story. But even with all the authority and respect he commanded, Pericles was not a president, king, head archon, emperor, or any of that. Officially, throughout his political career, he was just one of the ten strategoi, or generals that decided Athenian military matters, chief amongst them most of the time. Unofficially, he was Athens' leading citizen, and in this new government, his power was based solely on his ability to persuade, convince, and steer others to vote for his ideas. Upon securing this eminent position, however, his first priority was to convince Athens to prepare for war. The target was Corinth, not because they had it coming or anything, after all, Athens and Corinth had a long amicable history together, but because a third polis had gotten in the way of their happy relationship. The city of Megara, located on the northern part of the Isthmus of Corinth, decided to abandon its current membership in the Peloponnesian League and join up with the Athenians. It made good sense at the time. Athens was the rising star, and the expansion of the Delian League meant opportunities for Megara too. But the alliance was too much for the Corinthians, who felt Athens was creeping way too close to their territory. It was bad enough that the Athenians took the survivors of the Helot uprising and settled them in coastal lands north of Corinth. Now with an allied port in the south as well, Athens would have a stranglehold on the shipping lanes. Without an apparent way to rectify the situation, Corinth goes to war against its former ally. Now, Pericles isn't the sort of general to rush out guns a-blazing, and shields a clangin'. But instead gives the okay on a massive defensive project, a series of interconnecting, heavily fortified long walls linking Athens to her southern port city of Piraeus called, well, the Long Walls. By the time construction was finished, the two cities were ringed with two sets of walls, making them almost completely impenetrable to a land assault. And perhaps sensing that this meant bad news for their fellow Peloponnesian ally, in 457, Sparta declares war on Athens. Does it need to be mentioned that nearly 20 years earlier, the two fought side by side against Xerxes? Sparta's hoplites kept the Athenians and their Delian League allies busy on land, but most of the fighting that took place in the 450s was by sea. And it wasn't even in Greece. Under Pericles' leadership, the Delian League had not forgotten its original mission statement. To pick a fight with the Persians wherever they be, and they be in Egypt where a charismatic Libyan prince had successfully stirred up the locals to revolt, again, against Persian rule. Pericles saw a happy opportunity here to significantly weaken the new king Artaxerxes and make a powerful ally out of Egypt. He launched a fleet of 200 triremes loaded up with hoplites down to the coast of Africa. Joining up with the rebels, the Delian League gave everything they could at the Siege of Memphis, old city of the pharaohs and current seat of the Persian satrapy. Except Artaxerxes would not lose Egypt, nor would he get bogged down in the fighting like Darius had done so many years before. He sent a massive army, 
hundreds of thousands by ancient estimates, led by the skilled general Megabyzus, with orders to squash the revolt and destroy the Greeks. The Egyptian rebels capitulated early at the sight of such an enormous army, leading the Athenians to seek sanctuary on an island out in the Nile Delta. This was their refuge, where they resisted siege for over a year, desperately waiting for a relief that would never come. Artaxerxes would not starve them out, nor negotiate as his predecessors might do. He ordered all the channels around the island drained, stranding the Greek ships and creating a direct path to the island. Persian infantry rushed in and decimated the Athenians, leaving just enough to return home to tell of their failure. Afterwards, Megabyzus was sent up to Cyprus along with a Phoenician fleet. The Delian League had been doing a number on the island for the better part of the last ten years, and the Persians had had enough of Greek meddling. Riding high off his success in Egypt, Megabyzus scores enough victories that Pericles convinces Chemon, newly returned from his ostracism exile, to lead the army there in 451. He scores a few notable wins, but died of disease later that year. Soon the fighting between the two powers would end with the Peace of Callias. Everyone was finally sick and tired of the decades' worth of war. Back home, peace with Sparta came in 445, although Athens gained little out of it. Megara was back under the Peloponnesian League, after having underestimated that friendship with Athens meant having Athenian hoplites occupy your city. Other Athenian-held lands in Euboea decided to rebel, finding their colonial master's strange blend of imperialism and democracy a bit off for their tastes. Still, this treaty, dubbed the Thirty-Year Peace, laid out some pretty concrete ground rules. Athens and Sparta agreed to stay out of each other's zone of control. Sparta in the Peloponnese, and Athens in the Aegean, and that neither would cause harm towards the other. Neutral parties were free to join either clubhouse, and all disagreements would be settled by words, and not swords. Pericles the Olympian, perhaps realizing that he may have overextended the army too much, agreed to the terms. He returned to Athens a little wiser in this humbling defeat, and began shifting his focus back towards that of his home city. Without missing a beat in 451, he jumped right back into politics, specifically espousing the radical democracy that got him there in the first place. He lowered the property requirements of certain political positions, granting those who had once been shut out from serving a chance to contribute. He also instituted juror pay, which really makes a difference if you work for a living. And perhaps most notable of all his reforms to really stick it to the aristocracy was his new citizenship law. This decree prevented the children of an Athenian man and a non-Athenian woman from becoming a full citizen, and therefore receiving all the political perks of being one. This was really designed to prevent the Blue Bloods from making marriage alliances with rich foreigners and creating powerful and lasting dynasties in the city. Not that you couldn't create your own dynasty, you just had to keep it in the family, so to speak. Foreigners, or medics as they were called, were an important part of Athenian society. Because they couldn't serve in politics, they were free to enter into business, both men and women, and it was not uncommon for an Athenian man to take a medic for a lover, as would happen to Pericles. Aspasia of Miletus, a courtesan by trade, and to be technical, a hetaira, which could sort of be compared to a Japanese geisha, and sort of. These are women prized more for their intelligent conversation and social skills than, say, other talents. They would be expected to converse about any topic, history, art, politics, and Aspasia was the best of all. Socrates himself loved conversing with her and was quoted as saying, Aspasia, the admirable mistress I have in the art of speaking, she who has made so many good speakers, one of whom was the best among all the Greeks, Pericles. Showing the mighty Olympian a thing or two about speechcraft left a big impression on Pericles. In fact, he was so unabashedly smitten with her that he fell head over heels in love, divorcing his Athenian wife, and first cousin, ew, just to be with Aspasia. Plutarch remarks that Pericles would publicly kiss her before going to work, and then again when he returned. Which should elicit many awes from everyone listening because people just didn't do stuff like that back then. He was so in love with her that later on in their life when she's put on trial for social corruption, Pericles shocks the jury by weeping openly at the thought of losing her. He wins the case, by the way. Cute as their relationship was, it got him into a fair bit of trouble, too. 
He was definitely ridiculed behind his back for daring to treat her as an equal, and she ended up bearing him a bouncing baby Pericles Jr. out of wedlock. Scandalous. But aside from the tabloid stuff, their relationship was also viewed with suspicion, especially after Pericles sent the Athenian army to intervene in a war between Samos and Miletus, in which he had the defeated Samian leaders tied up on wooden posts and left to die. Brutal and scary especially considering that Samos was a ship-contributing member of the Delian League. And, hey wait, wasn't Aspasia from Miletus? Hmm... Well, nothing proven, but suspicious all the same. Anyway, enough about his personal life. Pericles was also responsible for completely giving Athens a much-needed facelift. The city was coming back after its destruction nearly two decades earlier, but it was still really lacking the sort of facilities a capital city needs. Pericles launches a massive construction program to build monuments, temples, and gymnasiums for sports training. He commissions a large odeon, or open-air theater, in which he invites celebrated authors and playwrights of the day to share their works. Names like Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, and our old buddy Herodotus, on tour promoting his book, The Histories. It's the talk of the town! Is it all true? Who cares? It makes for good reading. But above all his accomplishments, nothing matches the splendor and glory that is the Parthenon. Earth's proudest gem, as Emerson would say, was built to replace the earlier temples to Athena on the Acropolis that had been destroyed in the Persian Wars. Since Athens was in a far better place than it was during those wars, this temple needed to be bigger and better than anything the city had ever seen before. Construction began in 447 under the watchful eye of the great artist Phidias, who would later go off to Olympia and build one of the seven wonders of the world. Yeah, he's that kind of guy. Fifteen years, five thousand talents of gold, and twenty thousand tons of marble later, the Parthenon would be finished, a true masterpiece in every sense of the word. Intricately carved scenes of mythological events decorate each side of the roof, all painted in bright, bold colors. The many columns supporting the roof each tilt slightly inward to enhance stability, and creates the illusion that the rigid building is something gentler, something more fluid than it really is. And at the heart of the Parthenon was a giant statue of Athena herself, designed by Phidias and crafted from ivory, silver, and nearly forty talents worth of gold. The image of the goddess would stand tall and proud over her greatest building. It must truly have been breathtaking to see in its original and untarnished form. And good thing too it was so perfect, because it distracted people from a question they should have been asking. How the heck did he get the money to pay for this all? Athens was rich, but not that rich. Well, for the answer to that, we look at a sneaky thing Pericles did in the late 450s. Citing piracy and Persian invasion for his reasons, Pericles orders the Delian League treasury moved off of Delos and into Athens, where he most likely took funds out to build the Parthenon. Now yes, he's technically correct. Putting all that gold and loot on a tiny island is a bad idea. But transferring all that wealth to the most powerful city in the League, and then using defense funds for art? Well, I mean, I like where he's going with this, but it's a pretty obvious message to his allies as to who's really in charge. But enough about building projects and urban renewal. Let's see if the 30 years peace will really last 30 years. It's now 433 BC. Twelve years after the treaty was agreed on, and the scene shifts to the city of Corcyra, located on the island of Corfu in northwest Greece. They used to be a Corinthian colony, but have since grown strong enough to break away and form their own colony named Epidamnus, which was going through their own internal strife over whether to be a democracy or an old-school oligarchy. The Democrats appealed to Cochira for help, but they were turned down, so off to the Corinthians they went, where they found a more receptive audience ready to intervene. Chafed at the thought of military involvement in what is clearly their zone of affairs, the Cochirians attack the Corinthian fleet and soundly defeat them. But all that did was just anger Corinth, who set about creating a larger and stronger fleet than before. Whoops! Afraid of retribution, and knowing that Sparta's alliance with Corinth meant no deal there, Cochira sends ambassadors to Athens, pleading for an alliance. This is definitely a tricky situation, as though Cochira is neutral and therefore fair game, allying with the city meant inevitable conflict with the Peloponnesian League. So Pericles, handling the talks, agrees to a purely defensive alliance. Oh, you know, like those ever work out. And to show his good intentions, he sends a token fleet of ten triremes to observe the Cochirian fleet, 
with orders only to engage if things looked really bad. But really, I mean ten ships, what harm could ten do? Ah, except Pericles neglected to mention that a secret follow-up force of an additional twenty triremes were hanging back, waiting for the right moment to smack the Corinthians around, which they did in the late summer of 433. The result of the fighting is that Corinth slunk back home, and Sparta watched cautiously, biding her time. Soon after, Pericles continued to push Corinth's buttons, forcing a Corinthian colony, and Delian League member no less, to expel Corinthian guards and tear down their walls. Panicked, the colony appealed to the Peloponnesians for support, and Corinth vowed to send soldiers if Athens attacked. Sparta? Well, they still waited. Then, for reasons not completely agreed upon why, Pericles cancelled all trade rights with Megara, the city which began all the fun and confusion at the beginning of this episode. Megaran merchants were banned from entering Athenian ports, possibly in retaliation for aiding Corinth during the Kokaira crisis. This dealt a significant economic blow to the port city, and after pleading with the Peloponnesian League, Sparta sends ambassadors to Athens looking for a way to calm down what appeared to be unnecessary aggression coming from the Athenians. The negotiating lasted a few months until in 431, the city of Thebes, annoyed at their ally Sparta's hemming and hawing, decided enough is enough and attacked the town of Plataea, an ally of Athens. Now that unchecked violence was on the table, it appeared the thirty-year peace had officially ended. Sparta knew there was nothing more they could do, and declared war on Athens. And in that city, standing before a nervous assembly, Pericles spoke. You should know that go to war we must, and if we accept it willingly rather than not, we shall find the enemy less disposed to press us hard. Our fathers withstood the Persians without the resources we have, and even abandoned what they had. But by counsel, more than by fortune, and by daring, and by strength, beat off the barbarian, and advanced us to our present height. We must not fall short of them, but repel our enemies in every way. The Peloponnesian War had begun, although it started with more of a whimper than a bang. Sparta had sent her hoplites out to burn Athenian-held farmlands, hoping to lure the Athenians into open battle except Pericles, as head general, was more interested in defensive strategies. The long walls were up and solidly reinforced. There's no way anyone was getting through them, and there's no way Sparta could best Athens on the open sea. So Athens didn't really need those farms. With their naval dominance, the city could simply import all the food it needed and dominate the Peloponnesian coastline. Pericles orders all men, women, and children in the surrounding Attican region to take refuge inside the city walls. We'll wait the Spartans out. By the end of that first year, Athens dominated the Aegean, while Sparta controlled the land. But come the next year in 430, a new crisis emerged within the city that Pericles himself could not have predicted or talked his way out of. For you see the sudden influx of so many people into a limited space, not to mention terrible hygienic conditions and possibly a bad shipment of grain, created all the conditions necessary for disease. Between 430 and 429, a plague swept through Athens, ultimately wiping out nearly a quarter of the population. To this day, researchers are unsure if it was smallpox, bubonic plague, or even anthrax, but so far the best guesses are either typhus or typhoid fever. The historian Thucydides, to whom we know all about the Peloponnesian War from, was in the city at the time and contracted the disease. Miraculously, he recovered and had the brilliant foresight to record the symptoms, so that future generations would know of its horrors. People in good health were all of a sudden attacked by violent heats in the head and redness and inflammation in the eyes, the inward parts such as the throat and tongue becoming bloody and emitting an unnatural and foul breath. These were followed by sneezing and hoarseness, after which the pain reached the chest and produced a hard cough. When it fixed in the stomach, it upset it, and discharges a bile of every kind named by physicians ensued. That's in addition to the burning skin, diarrhea, pustules, insomnia, amnesia, dementia, and all in all just being a really hard, gross kind of thing. Frustrated by the breakdown of the city, and angered by the order not to march out and engage the enemy, the people actually voted Pericles out, but since no military leader elected in his place had the capabilities that he did, Pericles was shortly voted back in, although it wouldn't make a difference. Pericles is not the same man he was before. 
He had contracted the plague at the end of 430, and it hit him, as Plutarch writes, with a dull lingering distemper, wasting the strength of his body and undermining his noble soul. The plague had also claimed both of his sons from his first marriage, leaving just his illegitimate son to carry his name. But the citizenship law Pericles pushed in prohibited Pericles Jr. from inheriting his father's estate, and all the rights that come from being an Athenian. Well, I guess there's nothing you can do about it, Pericles. Oh wait, of course there is, because he's the guy with the silver tongue. And he's granted a special exception for his son, in light of his service to the city. Pfft, politicians. His affair is in order, but demoralized from the horrific effects of the plague upon his city and himself, Pericles dies in 429. He was survived by his wife, his son, the Parthenon, and a massive war that threatens to tear Greece apart. Each side is waiting for the other to flinch, to do something and really mess up. But the Athenians are snug within their walls while their ships do the fighting, and the Spartans are struggling to find anybody left to pick a fight with on land. Any day now, something's gotta give. So let's pick it up there next time with the Peloponnesian War on the podcast history of our world. Peace, hey,